here's how we're going to use our time uh, for this discussion. We'll, we'll spend the majority of our time today on the unwanted pregnancy case. Um, and I want to spend a good bit of our time uh, on that, dealing with the other moral issues besides the decision to end the pregnancy. We'll give, we'll give some background to abortion, but I want to, I want to save the discussion of ending the pregnancy for next time. Okay? So we'll, we'll deal with all the details on that. The reason for that is because it, that discussion presumes a conversation on the moral status of fetuses, which takes us right into where I want to go on the third session on this, which is the moral status of embryos outside the womb and the discussion of stem cell research. All right, so we'll treat those two things together the next two sessions. But I want to, after introducing some background, we'll spend the majority of the discussion today on the unwanted pregnancy case. Okay, so let me just show of hands, how many of you are writing on that? Okay, all right, good. Okay, and just... Does that, does that include how many attempts? Sorry? Does that include how many attempts? Yeah, that's good enough for now. Um, so if you change your intention, you're entitled to do that. So uh, let me give you some, some additional resources on this. Um, I think the chapter in Moral Choices is helpful on this and gives you sort of the lay of the land, but it doesn't, it doesn't give you anywhere close to the, the depth of the discussion on this. Okay, so if you want to read a little bit further, I really recommend that uh, you do that. Uh, although, if, I, if you're going to do this, you know, probably get, look for this used somewhere. Uh, this is, this is uh, it's called The Abortion Controversy, 25 Years After Roe v. Wade. It's a reader that our good friend Frank Beckwith and uh, the late Louis Poyman have edited. It's, it is all the classic readings on abortion. I mean, it's all the classic articles. It's, it, you got them all in one place. It's really, it's a terrific resource. Unfortunately, it's about $125 new, which is, God bless Beckwith, I love him to death, but that's more than it's worth. <laughs> so, uh, Especially for compiling. I want, I want that to go on YouTube. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's really, ex it's really an excellent resource. Uh, and he's got, you know, Q&A and a little bit of commentary. Uh, but it's, I, I'd look, look for it used if, if I were you. Um, then uh, Beckwith has also done, and, uh, he's a philosophy prophet Baylor, who's a, a, good, a good friend of all of us in the Phil program at Talbot. Uh, his the, his uh, Defending Life, uh, A Moral and Legal Case Against Abortion Choice, is one of the best things out there. This is a revision of an earlier work that he did that he took the, he took the, uh, the uh, offensiveness of the title out of it so some pro-choice folks will actually read this. Uh, the former version was called Politically Correct Death. Uh, <laughs> And so it's, if you know Frank, that's sort of, that's sort of the title, sort of like him. Uh, but this is, is really well done um, and has a, an, just an, uh, you know, this part two especially is, I mean, is really, really well done. So highly, highly recommended on this. Um, and then two other works that I'd also very much recommend. Uh, Patrick Lee is a Catholic philosopher uh, who's written Abortion and Unborn Human Life. This one it follows the, the logical progression of making the argument uh, for the right to life of the unborn, at probably as clearly and concisely as you'll find. I mean, is, this is, again, really well done. Uh, there's nothing that's distinctly uh, theological or biblical about this. 
And so, you know, I say if you have a, you know, a next door neighbor or, you know, co-worker or somebody that you're chewing on this issue with, um, this is one, no, nobody can say, well, it's, you know, it's religiously biased. Okay? Because even though he's a Catholic philosopher, uh, there's, there's no invoking God or scripture or theology or anything like that uh, throughout. And then the, the most recent thing that's out, this is called The Ethics of Abortion, uh, Women's Rights, Human Life, and the Quest for Justice. Uh, Chris Kazor has become a good friend of our department. He's a philosophy prophet, loyal to Marymount, and a great guy. I'd never gotten to know him until the book came out. We, had, we invited him to come speak to our, our uh, philosophy seminar last spring when we, when we used this as one of our texts and uh, went through. Had a great, we had a great time just kicking this around with him. Uh, this, this follows somewhat the same form as Patrick Lee's, uh, but he includes some other material, like for his, his last chapter here is Abortion Permissible in Hard Cases. Uh, is, is really well done. Um, and then he's got a whole section here on artificial wombs. Could art, artificial wombs end the abortion debate, which I think is, is possible. Um, and then you know, he addresses all the philosophical questions, too. This, this is really well done, too. So any, any, any one of those three, I think, would be hard to go wrong with, but I, I would really encourage you to read something further than what, than what you'll read for the class on this. So, you know, when you graduate and get your life back, you know, then you can re read something else. But I really encourage you to look at something else. Okay, any questions on those? Okay. If you want, I can give you some references to some of the best works that espouse a pro-choice view as well. Uh, so if you, if you, I'll bring a couple of those next time. Uh, but predominantly, I'd say the, the work of the, the, uh, the University of Colorado philosopher David Boonin is prob he's probably the most articulate contemporary spokesperson for uh, liberal abortion rights. I mean, that there's some of the classic pieces which we cited in the reading by Judith Jarvis Thompson and Marianne Warren and Michael Tooley and uh, you referenced Peter Singer. Uh, you know, those are all, you know, really committed pro-choice advocates to you be, I mean, I think, yeah, a Google search on any of those would probably unearth some significant stuff. Yeah. Not really. Not really. The, the way the way it's it's done is they they will say, you know, I think abortion's immoral but it shouldn't be illegal. So it's more, the more the argument they're making is, is what the law should be. I don't hear too many evangelicals who take the scripture seriously make the case that abortion is a moral option. Uh, now we'll, we'll, although she's not a Christian by any stretch, but we will look at the, we made reference to this in the reading, the work of Naomi Wolf, who, who actually interestingly invokes the notions of sin and redemption to accompany the abortion decision, which you can tell. I mean, it's, 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 you can tell by the way she does this that she's not a theologian, uh, because sin and redemption don't function as a justification for some for something. It's sort of making. You're making, you're making, she's making a, a really dangerous, to her case, assumption about the action, right, being, being wrong if she needs to invoke the categories of sin and redemption for that. And, I, and that's an assumption I don't think she wants to make uh, in making that case. But what, what you will find today is among pro-choice advocates, 
it's, it's very rare now that they'll refer to fetuses as products of conception or pieces of tissue. Uh, when Clinton's President, former President Clinton's Surgeon General, Jocelyn Elder, stated we need to get over our love affair with the fetus. Those kinds of callous ways of regarding the unborn are just technologically unfeasible today. Uh, and so and the, 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 the opinion of the public has shifted, I think pretty dramatically. Although the majority of the public are, do not support uh, Res, res, uh, restrictions on first trimester abortions. Uh, most, the majority now in the public are profoundly uncomfortable with full abortion on demand too. So there seems to be a growing consensus that in the second and third trimesters there ought to be some more significant limits on what's available, but not in the first. So and there, there, I, I have heard some pro-life folks concede that if, if the law were to prohibit second and third trimester abortions and allow first, that that would be okay. Not, not ideal, but that, that would say that would be an improvement for the unborn. Okay. All right. You know, you know, pass those around. I'll, I'll appreciate getting those back. At the end. All right, here's the scenario that uh, you're going to be writing on. And again, I, I can't emphasize enough how, how we think through this, particularly with the other moral questions relating to marriage and adoption. Now, some of, some of these, the marriage question is probably not entertained very often. Okay? And the reason for that is because usually you don't have two willing partners with an unwanted pregnancy. Now we're going we're to make some assumptions about the facts on this. And I th what I want you to see on this is that how, what, what the facts are may make a pretty significant difference in the moral conclusions that we come to. Not on, not, not, for the most part, not on the decision to end the pregnancy, but certainly on the other moral decisions that I think are, the, the scripture is not quite as clear about. And there's room for discussion and debate about the various options. How, how we think about this, the criteria that we use to make this decision, those are the things that we need to, to try and settle on. Because I don't think with the decision about marriage and adoption that there's a clear sort of black and white, you know, that's, 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 a, that's a got to for every situation. Right? Now, I think the decision to end the pregnancy is pretty straightforward. Right? And we'll, we'll look at the, the biblical and philosophical underpinnings of that next time. Right? But just by way of introduction to this, uh, the, then this is what I, the first thing I probably emphasize to this woman who has this unwanted pregnancy, that under the law, this is her decision. It is, it's not the guy's decision, it's not the parent's decision. It is strictly her decision as long as she's 18 or above. Right? Now, you can, you can, for, for your purposes here, I, I have, I've deliberately left some of the facts unspecified. Right? And that's, that's intentional. Because as, you, as we think about this and as you write this up, what the facts are in one set of circumstances will, will change the moral decisions that are made. All right? that's, not, that's not to say we're, you know, we're situation ethics here or this is, we're relativist. But in the areas that are more gray, 
and have some ambiguity to them, what the facts look like makes a big difference. Okay. So the combination of Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton gave women virtually unrestricted access to abortion throughout all nine months of pregnancy. Please don't accept the conventional wisdom that many people in our culture believe that abortion is legal until viability and illegal after that. Okay? That's not true. Otherwise, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be having the debate over the partial birth abortion and other late-term abortion techniques. All right? That was the combination of these two decisions. And I say, we pointed out in the reading, particularly the part in the Doe v. Bolton decision, which gave the woman the right to appeal to matters of her health, which included emotional, psychological, uh, and even familial <coughs> health. Okay, anybody clear on what, we, what, what that meant? Maybe which means she's got so many kids that it's going to swamp her boat emotionally or financially. Okay. Right. Now, what, what that did, essentially, when, when the justification for ending the pregnancy got expanded from the life of the mother being in jeopardy to the health of the mother being in jeopardy, and once, once that got expanded, that opened the door, and especially once you included familial health in that. That opened the door to abortion virtually on demand. Okay. Now the Doe decision also specified that the decision was between the woman and her physician. No, nobody else could come into that. And even though physicians, most, most physicians who would perform the abortion procedure are not trained in the emotional and psychological and familial factors. I mean, they don't have degrees in psychology, psychiatry, or social work to be able to make those assessments. Okay. But, but be that as it may, that's, that's a kind of a no charge for that point. But saying that it was the decision between the woman and her physician alone basically said that any justification that is agreed to between the woman and her physician is an acceptable one. Okay. So we, we've, we've had, from, basically from the start, have had abortion on demand. All right, now the the courts have ruled that there are some late-term abortion procedures that are restricted. Now, if you want to Google, the most recent decision on this was in 2007, the Carhart v. Gonzalez decision. If you want to Google that, you read a little bit more about that. Um, but that decision did not end late-term abortions. Now, it just ended a specific procedure for performing late-term abortions. Okay, there's a big difference. All right? Um, okay, questions on that? Okay, now, here, let's, let's assume these facts, okay, for our initial discussion of this case, okay? Let's assume that the girl's 19 years old, okay? So she's an adult, uh, and we'll assume that she's a sophomore in college. We'll assume that her family is uh, in another part of the country, okay? And so her family is not local. We'll also assume that the couple in view has only known each other for three months. And what happened here, the reason she's pregnant is because 
it was one of their first moments of passion together that just got away from them. Okay? They didn't, I mean, they, this was not in the, I mean, this is sort of the classic unwanted pregnancy. I mean, not, not a hookup, but clearly, uh, you know, they, don't, they haven't known each other very long, and the decision, it, normally in these types of circumstances, the decision to end the pregnancy is a slam dunk. All right? And we'll also assume that she's getting significant pressure from her parents to end the pregnancy. One more assumption here. Uh, we're going to assume that they are both in your college ministry, okay, although the girl is new to your ministry. Okay. The guy is, we'll just say, he's the guy that you've been discipling. Okay. Trying to make this, I'm going to make this as sticky a wicket as I can. And you have, you have uh, ministered well to him, and he's a stand-up guy who is willing to you know, do whatever is necessary to fulfill his responsibilities. If that means marrying her, he'll do that. Uh, if not, you know, he's, I mean, he's, he's, he, we'll just say he's a stand-up a stand guy. All right now, I know that most guys in this position are not stand-up guys. Okay, I'm aware the norm is that the guy splits and wants nothing to do any longer with the girl or the baby. That's right. Okay. Okay. Now we we will we will adopt that set of assumptions when we go to the question of adoption. Right? And, of course, that set of assumptions makes the, the question of marriage a completely a moot point. Right? Now, just to, to show you the difference, I mean, think about those set of facts. Okay? Now, let's, let's change the facts just for a moment. And let's say that they've been dating for the last three years and are starting to talk about marriage. They hadn't gotten very far, but they're starting to talk about it. They know each other really well. Uh, they, both, they, they both have lived on their own without being dependent on their parents for a stretch. Um, and they both have very supportive families willing to do whatever is necessary for the well-being of the child. Okay. All right, now you see, you're with me on that? That's a completely different set of circumstances, and I suspect that you're already beginning to suggest that your advice to them might change given you know, whichever set of facts are in play. All right? Now, let's go, let's take these set of facts over here. Okay? What I would call the Almost the worst case scenario, except for the guy being a stand-up guy. I mean, if he splits, then you've got the, uh, the norm, which I think is pretty close to a worst case scenario. This over here, I think given that they've done this out of order, notwithstanding, this is probably the best case scenario that you could have for dealing with something like this. All right? Okay, now... What, let's say you, you've got this woman and her, I don't know, her boyfriend is probably not quite accurate if they've known each other just three months, but her, her friend. They would call them, they could call them. Friends. They could. By, by now, maybe they would. Uh, right? They're sitting across the table from you in your office, uh, and they want to know what to do about ending the pregnancy, about marriage. And about adoption. Okay. So I'll give you about two minutes with the person next to you to just answer those questions. In the pregnancy, yes or no. Marriage, yes or no. Adoption, 
yes or no. Okay, guys, let's have a uh, show, of, show of hands here uh, on, on the end, ending the pregnancy for yes. Okay. Just, just checking here. Okay. Uh, I take it as no for ending the pregnancy. Okay. All right. Uh, for marriage, how many of you would say yes for marriage? On the first set of facts, yeah. Which is the worst 19, case. Uh, right, right, worst case scenario. Right, right. But we're assuming he's a stand-up guy. Don't, just a yes or no. No. No, okay, all right. So, okay, so hands up for yes. Okay, all right. Hands up for no. This is an everybody votes thing. Okay, you have to vote. You have to vote. Oh, she voted yes. Okay, all right. Okay, now, obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but if they get married, maybe the chances are that the adoption discussion is off the table, right? Probably not in every case, but most of the time that'll be off the table. So under the assumption that they don't get married, okay, how many would say yes to putting the baby up for adoption? Right? How many would say no to that? Just one, just one no? Okay. okay, very interesting. All right, now, this set of facts over here. All right, best case scenario, okay? How many of you would, uh, I take it, I, huh? Well, I know, but you can respond back just if we don't. <laughs> it's not, so what? <laughs> All right, All right. Uh, I take it the answer on ending the pregnancy will be the same. Right? Uh, and how about uh, for, how many of you would say yes to marriage? Yeah. Okay. Did anybody say no to marriage? Okay. Uh, okay. And assuming they don't get married, how many of you would say uh, yes to putting the baby up for adoption? Right. Okay. All right. Okay. So basically, that's, that answer is basically the same. All right. Uh, now, what, what, what kinds of questions, what kind, you know, sort of help us frame the, the pastoral dimension to this? Because you've got, you've got a lot of serious pastoral work to do here before you can even approach some of the moral dimensions. So what, what does that look like? We're com we are coming to that. We, 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 will, we will clarify that. You, all of you have um, latent criteria for making that call. Okay? And we'll, we'll spell them out, both for marriage and for adoption. Okay? Right? But let, 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 I mean, the pastoral dimension here is it's a serious one. Right? She's coming into your office saying, essentially, I'm pregnant. My life is ruined. Right? So what, what do you say to that? Do we agree? <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> to play the devil's advocate here sometime. <laughs> huh? Okay. Right. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Because what's she assuming here when she says her life is it's over? What's she assuming? That that the, that that the, the, the guy's going to leave, that she's going to have to quit quit school, get a job, you know. 40, 50 hours of daycare a week for a baby. Uh, you know, she's going to be one of, you know, one of those statistics about teenage single moms. And she, just, she sees the trajectory of her life heading downhill. Right? Now, what, what do we say to that? Is that true? Not 
Okay, all right. Okay, for one, uh, she, you know, I, I would question her prophetic gifts. <laughs> right? It's not, it's not clear that that's a necessary you know, unfolding of all of this. Okay? Um, all right? She'll probably want details of how it could be different. Which, again, under these sets of facts, is much trickier to provide than the, the best case scenario set of facts. What else does she need to know for pastorally? Okay. Okay, that, that's a, a, bo both really significant pastoral points. One, I think we, we, it's very important to affirm that uh, the church will be there to provide support, encouragement. Uh, she's going she's to need a lot of support if we're really going to live up to that. But the, I don't think, I mean, the question is not, you know, are we able to live up to that? That's our, that's our responsibility as a church. Now, the cultural thing, okay, that's a different matter. Right? Now, some of you who are in Asian American churches, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Is that, is, is that, is that a, a huge problem that she's got to overcome? So, even giving her all of the options to keep the baby, that was still a huge problem. Okay? How, do we, how do we address that theologically? So that, that's, a, I mean, that's a huge problem, right? How do we address that? Because it seems to me this, this, is a, this is a point at which our theology has to speak into our culture. Right? How do we do that? Yeah. Okay, so what what you're suggesting here is that the 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 guilt and shame that tend to come as part of the culture, uh, our our theology is basically not up to that. Okay, I appreciate the, the candor with which you say that. I think that's really helpful. Okay. But at the same time, I think that should really trouble us that that it's not. Which, you know, that raises a whole. I mean, that raises dozens of other questions that we that are beyond our scope here. Yeah. Okay, which means what? Which means like, you know, when someone's coming in, maybe they have that perspective and that they, they hold to those presuppositions about guilt and, and, and they come in not so much on our shame, but right. due to guilt and kind of working. So that would, that would lead them to draw different conclusions? Right. Okay, yeah. That your duty may be, um, in fact, I've heard, I've actually, we've had, they're very interesting, I don't know if this is what you're referring to, but we've had some, uh, some native Africans who have responded to this 
really interestingly, because they, from their view, uh, as just one example, but in their view, when, when a woman has an unwanted pregnancy, they get married. I mean, it's really simple. We're, we're in these, in the, the parts of uh, Africa where they've come from, uh, it's not a tough call, you know. Uh, I mean, and sometimes, sometimes the, the, you know, the, the, the elders will use some mildly coercive measures that resemble something akin to shotgun weddings uh, to make that happen. Right? So that, that, that's the duty guilt thing. That I, that's how I'm understanding what you're saying. That, no, I know. But that's how I'm, that's how, that's just an example of what I, uh, it might lead you to a different conclusion. Yeah. Right. 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 And it may be just whatever your you know, local church culture is that would do that. Well, and this might play into the duty guilt concept. One of the first things you have to explain, get her to understand, is that that baby is a human being who is completely innocent in this that's situation, right. No, that's right. who who will suffer all of the consequences of this situation, and if, no, that's if she right. goes forward with an abortion. Okay. No, that's right. All right. So well, we've got we got some serious pastoral work. Okay. One is I think we need to emphasize that there there is nothing that is beyond God's redeeming value. This, this is not an unforgivable sin. Okay. And that e even, though, even though our families may, may look upon, even though, let's put it, even though our families may see this as a source of shame, okay. That's, I mean, it's diametrically opposed to the way God sees this woman. And I would, I mean, I would ref, just reflect back on uh, all, all, of the women, all of the women in the life of Jesus who came from very, very checkered backgrounds who were nonetheless some of the most relationally uh, close and intimate with Jesus. Um, And I, and I guess I, I would want to affirm to her that, one, your point's right. You're, you're not omniscient. You don't know how this is going to play out in the future. But that, you know, regardless of what is coming from the people around you, God is not shaming you for this. And there is nothing, I would emphasize, there's nothing in, in our lives that is irredeemable. I think particularly something like this where you know where you know one of God's greatest miracles is about to unfold. And yet we would consider that a, so, a source of uh, you know a, a source of shame and of guilt uh, and of of shortcoming. Now granted she has done this out of order. True. <clears throat> but she knows, they both know that they goofed. Okay? Now, if, if they were not clear about that, <coughs> excuse me, then there's probably a pastoral component to making sure that that's clear. But most people with unwanted pregnancies know that they've goofed. Particularly, this girl knows and the guy knows that they are they are doing the sort of the dating, marriage, and childbearing thing in reverse order. Right? Yeah. I'm just trying to think through the situation and how you could do that in reverse order, where they would have the baby and then they would date and I mean dating through that period and then get married later on. How you what could, would happen? Like um, I you that that I think that's one option that's on the table. <coughs> now, the, the 
Here's what, what makes that so tricky, and this relates to the marriage decision, is that ideally you want to evaluate their fitness for marriage apart from the baby. But then it takes on the status of being the elephant in the living room. And you can't, I mean, you, you can't take the baby out of the picture here. So what I mean by dating is them really getting to know each other and assessing their fitness for marriage. Right? Now, once we get out of the decision to end the pregnancy and into the decision about marriage and adoption, we leave the world of absolutes right, and move into a much grayer area. Okay? That being said, there, it does seem to me there is one moral absolute that governs the decision to get married and the decision to put the baby up for adoption. Can you think of what that would be? I'm not, sure I can, I'm not sure we can articulate it quite in biblical or theological terms, but there's one, there, there's one thing that's not negotiable from here on out. And that would be ensuring the, that the well-being of the child is given first priority. Right? The, the, the well-being of the child now jumps to the top of the list. Right? And those of you who are parents know that that's kind of that's that's the definition of a, what being a parent is. You know, your needs are now way down here. Right? And so whatever decision we make about marriage and adoption needs to be done with the child's best interests at the top of the pile. We agree with that? Right, right, right. Now, we're, yeah, that's why we're bracketing the abortion decision here. We're assuming that she's now that she's going to keep the child. Okay. Um, now we and we'll, we'll we'll deal with that. Oh no. And see, here's no. That's right. Okay. Okay. And this is what again. This is what makes this so hard <clears throat> because we're not omniscient on this. I mean, think about all the things that could happen. Right? They, could, they could get married and it could be a disaster. Right? That wouldn't be completely unpredictable. Right? They could get married and they could live happily ever after. Right? Um, they could decide not to get married she meets somebody a year from now who embraces both her and the child. They live happily ever after. Okay? They decide not to get married. She never meets anybody and spends her life as a single mom, and the kid never has a dad. Okay? That's a possibility. Okay? Now, which one of those is most likely to happen? Right? I think some of, some of them have more probability attached to them than a coin flip. But even the, even the adoption decision, we, we still, we don't know. I mean, some women suffer incredibly. And it, I mean, I mean adoption marks their life forever in any case. But some women, I mean, really, some women never recover from giving a child up for adoption. Uh, and, some, and some children, although you know, I, think, I think probably all of us know heroic single moms, my guess is if you, if you ask them, the majority of them would say, this is not the way I would choose to raise a child. Right? Now you get there, you got some that would say different on that. But I think, I think most, if, in a, if they were really candid about it, they would say, this, this is impossibly hard task. Right? 
So here's the question then. What criteria would need to be satisfied before we would encourage this couple to get married? Now again, I'm operating under the what I think is a biblical assumption here that what's best for the child is to have two parents, two heterosexual parents, married happily living under the same roof. That's, we agree? That's the optimal environment for a child. Right. On the other hand, I, I suspect we would all agree that if this pregnancy were not in the picture, under these set of facts, we would never be encouraging this couple to get married at this point. Fair enough? Okay. So what, what criteria need to be in place, and if that means, you know, that may mean, you know, a different set of facts, Maybe we say under this set of facts, there's no conditions that could be met where we'd encourage them to get married. But what needs to be in place before you would urge them or encourage them to get married? Obviously, if I steal your thunder, I'm sorry. Uh, having two willing participants is first. Okay, but both, I think both need to see that, that they, are, they are in a really tough spot because of the decisions that they had made. Okay, what else? Yeah. I think it'd be important to, to assess the likelihood of success in their marriage through okay. pastoral counseling on okay. the one side. Okay, hold that thought just for a second. And I'd say a third is I would not, I would not want to be party to them getting married without some substantial premarital counseling. Okay. And I'd like to see both sets of in-laws and assess whether or not they're going to be supportive of this young family and to what degree they'll okay. be supportive All right. and how they'll okay. interact with this young family because they'll bear on the likelihood of okay. success. Okay. Family support, I think, is a – that's – I'm going to I'm going to refer to that more as this may not be quite accurate, but I'm not sure that's non-negotiable. It, no, it would be, not. but it's more than just gravy. Yeah, it, you know. Yeah. But it's um, that would be that would be terrific. That if we had that. That me. right. And that's a helpful if factor. You don't have parental support on both sides. It makes it a little more iffy to me. Even fair if enough. It's there. Fair enough. Yeah. <clears throat> and I don't know that I would start you know, the dialogue with her and her boyfriend or girlfriend, whatever he is, uh, right away just to make sure her feelings are okay. That's well said. Well, that's point, that point's well taken. Uh, you know, may, maybe what, we, what we're careful about is initiating these conversations prematurely. Uh, and, yeah, I would not want to jeopardize her health on yeah, this. Like yeah, well, that's right. Now that puts her, her, the stress points go off the charts with that. Okay. All right. So multiple levels of support and counsel. Uh, would we want to say something about just how well they know each other? That's why I'm I'm a lot more comfortable with the facts over here. I mean, I think if they're, and I think our, I mean, most of your intuitions, I think, tell you that just by the way you voted, because 
I mean, if, I think it's one thing if they're, I mean, if they're headed this direction already, that the pregnancy bumps the timetable up. I think that's, I don't see any harm in that. Uh, but here, you, you're in, I mean, you're, you're introducing all kinds of brand new stuff that are not even on the radar screen for, for most, for these couples. Uh, so that under these facts, I'd be inclined to say, with marriage, I'd be inclined to say, let's wait. And I think I, I, if, if the guy's a stand-up guy and wants to keep, you know, and they want to keep that option on the table, I don't think there's any problem keeping that on the table. But at this, over here, I wouldn't, I'd be saying to wait. There are too many, too many red flags that go up. Right? Over here, I don't have nearly as many red flags on this. Uh, they, they know each other. They're good candidates for marriage. Okay? Now, what, what do we say about to the person who says, hey, you know, look, look at the way marriages are done in most of the non-Western world, right? So, you know, what's the problem over here? Why not? Just, you know, yeah, it's out of order, but, you know, how is that all that different than an arranged marriage that is pretty successful in a lot of, lot of the, the non-Western world? In fact, being a dad of teenagers, I'm reconsidering that <laughs> myself. Uh, Right. Both sold on, you know, hey, we did this and this is where we want to take it, then I'd be able to work with people just a little bit more. Yeah, I, then, I, I, then I think my, if that were the case, I think my advice would be, you know, let's pr proceed, but not, right. not be in a hurry. Right? And the pregnancy, I don't think, should be the, 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 the one that dictates the timetable on that. But I think, yeah, the, then there I'd say that's, the, that's, Semi on the table. <laughs> oh. okay. One more, and then we need Where to stop. Spiritual development, development for the two of them as it relates to the marriage. One more. That's that's a good point. It's one more criteria that's very important in assessing their general fitness for marriage. It's their degree of maturity. You know, where are they spiritually? Those are all really important things. That's why I made the comment over here. That, that under this, under the best case scenario, they both lived independently of their parents. I, I'm not sure I would advise too many people to get married who are still dependent on their parents. Um, I mean, I think that, that raises, red, in my view, raises red flags by itself, uh, regardless of any of the other factors. Right? So, again, what I want you to see from this is that I don't, I don't think, here we, I, we can't draw firm lines in the sand on this. Um, this is one where we have to have criteria, and we will have sort of what you suggested, we'll have more or less comfort in suggesting that it move forward. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.